I'm Charlie Ray. I'm a writer, speaker, strategist, and consultant. You might have seen that I participated in Women Picket DC. I was a writing lead for a coalition of women who picketed executive order. I don't remember the number. <laughs> 13988. What was the number? <laughs> I got it right. We made the White House press briefing and we were covered by the media. I also spoke at a press conference and testified before the legislature here in Raleigh about a bill to protect women's sports. It was the Save Women's Sports Act 358, and I went with Beth Seltzer, who is an incredible woman traveling the country trying to pass bills and laws and lobby for legislation so that females can have protected sex categories. But I'm here today to talk about my story, about how I experienced gender dysphoria when I was a child. I've been speaking and writing about transgenderism for about five years, and I think I've only written about my story one time. And that's because I don't believe that you need to have had gender dysphoria to discuss transgenderism or to understand that transgenderism doesn't make any sense. Um, but we're told over and over again by those who say transgenderism is real and that it should be accepted and that it should be legally codified that you have to have experiences to go, th like you've had to go through it in order to hold a place at the table in the discussion. And so it's, I think in my view, it's becoming more important that I platform this part of myself and why I speak about transgenderism. It's not just because it doesn't make any sense and it's harmful, which is the majority of the reason why. It's I have an internal personal connection with this story and with this cause, because I went through this. When I was a child, I had gender dysphoria. I mean, any any of the language that they use today, having gender not, being gender nonconforming, um, having confused thoughts about your body, thinking you're born in the wrong body, and also the idea of a mythology. And that's something that we're told all the time by people who believe that this exists and want it codified into laws, that like you have you never experience it. You don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like to be suicidal, to go through it, or to feel like you're born in the wrong body or to not be accepted by society. Um, and I think that's false. You know, I think anyone can sit down and look at the research and figure out the logic behind what they're being told to accept. And that it's sort of like, it's a really convenient argument to stop anyone in their tracks. It's just like, if you haven't had it, then you can't speak on it. And that's repeated over and over again. And so I think it's becoming more important that those of us who experienced it and either um, never accepted transition or detransition come forward with our stories um, to show people that like this idea isn't true, that it's almost like I feel as though I have to give other people permission. Like, no, you don't have to have gone through gender dysphoria to understand what gender dysphoria is or to understand that medical transgenderism is harmful and dangerous or to go through the understanding of what gender would do to our laws if they're codified into our laws because those are just consequences, right? We can sit down and say, well, if children are being medically pathologized, that means like swaths of children are going to be going into plastic surgery because that's what the end road of medicalization is. It's plastic surgery. So I think any adult can have an understanding of why this is harmful. I don't think that you have to experience gender dysphoria to understand the reasons why it's harmful to, to put kids on a path to plastic surgery, especially now that we have so much research coming out that um, plastic surgery is addictive. It's not really a one and done sort of thing. It's like people become obsessed with it. So I'm here today to talk about my story of transgenderism. And this is different from the mainstream understanding of how gender dysphoria functions. Because when I went through my feelings that I was born in the wrong body, this entire culture didn't exist. I need to. Hi, Edie. Oh, this is Edie. So I had gender dysphoria from my earliest memories. Um, and I think that the majority of the reason for my gender dysphoria and my earliest memories was because I didn't want to do anything that the girls wanted to do. And so wherever I was, 
I wanted to do what the boys were doing. I wanted to play sports. I wanted to play in the mud. I wanted to climb trees. And when I was with my family or when I was with friends or when we go to school, it was like the girls didn't want to do those things. The girls were very much into um, like playing with their hair, playing with dolls or like not getting dirty or It was something that when you're a child, you're very viscerally aware that boys are over here and girls are over here. And even if we are playing sports, it's like you'd have a girls team and you'd have a boys team. And I didn't want to play with the girls and I didn't want to be on the girls team. And it leaned me in a certain direction and mythology started to form. And you can see these mythologies even from doctors today who are telling us that transgenderism is real, that if a child is gender non-conforming in any way, so if they don't want to do things that are typically assigned to females, if they want, if a girl wants to have short hair, if she wants to play sports, if she wants to play with the boys, there was a doctor that I saw that said if girls pull the berets out of their hair when they're a baby, it's like a pre-verbal gender sign that they're transgender. And so it's like, I fit that. I fit that mythology. And I had those ideas. Like, was I born in the wrong body? Should I have been born a boy? It's like the mythology becomes extensive. So for example, like my mom experienced very different pregnancies between me and my sister. So for a significant amount of time within her pregnancy, she thought I was a boy just because they were such different pregnancies. Um, and it just turns out that me and my sister just have opposite personalities. And so, but I was told this as a child, Obviously, you know, children have a difficult time up until I think like seven or eight distinguishing between fantasy and fact. And so that's just it's stuff that like sinks into you and gets into your head. That's it's difficult to grasp when you're a kid, especially when like all you want to do is fit in. We're pack animals like social inclusion needs are extremely important for any person, let alone a kid that has gender dysphoria and kind of feels out out of the group a little bit. Everybody has those um, social anxieties around being included. And so then it's like, if you feel like you're not naturally included in the group that you should be, you start to form these mythologies in your head. And I would argue that there are doctors now who have picked up these mythologies, that the idea of being in the wrong body is a mythology. It's an internal conceptualization it's an internal feeling and it's an oddity it's who am I you know it's an identity crisis and that's sort of a mythology right because who are you is your body at its most basic and so you can have an understanding of yourself as someone who's like gender non-conforming and that really just means that you don't fit into a box you don't fit into a group you don't fit into like what everybody else is doing and the mythology becomes you should have been different and that you are different on the inside. So as I grew up as a gender nonconforming female, it was uncomfortable. But when I was born, I was born in 1991 and I grew up in the 90s. Transgenderism wasn't in the common lexicon. It wasn't something that everybody spoke about. When I asked my mom if I was supposed to be a boy or if I was born in the wrong body, it's not, she didn't have this whole culture outside of her telling her that if I came to her and said that to her, she had to transition me. Or that if she didn't transition me, she was an abusive mother. And so because of that and because Honestly, because my mom experienced the same thing when she was a kid. She was gender nonconforming and she wanted to always hang out with the boys. And she had my grandfather take her fishing and go hang out at the men's club. And she had the same experience that I did. And so it's something that she saw in me, in herself, that these struggles with gender nonconformity were something that we just used to in the 90s refer to as sexism. You know, so when I came to my mom and said, I felt like I was born in the wrong body or I didn't fit in or like, am I a boy because I like sports? She recognized that as sexism, that I didn't feel like I fit in because there was this great divide between what girls are supposed expected to do and trained to do and what boys are expected to do and trained to do. And so when I came to my mom with these feelings that was I born in the wrong body or am I a boy on the inside because like I want to play sports or because I don't fit in or because... Like when I cut my hair short, everyone started calling me a dyke. And so it was very alienating to be who I was. And when my mom saw that, she saw it as sexism. 
Like we used to see that gender was sexism. We didn't learn about gender as you learn about gender now in school. When we learned about gender in the 90s, gender was a dirty word. It was considered a negative thing to separate girls into this box and boys into this box and say girls had to wear pink and boys had to wear blue. And we used to call them gender roles. And we used to say that they were bad. And that's what gender was when I was growing up. And so nobody came to me and told me that I needed like hormones. Nobody told me that I needed plastic surgery. Nobody told me I was born in the wrong body. People told me you were born in the right body and power to girls who want to play sports and be rough and cut their hair and do what you want because that's female empowerment. And so when my mom saw this, she not only did she not have this larger society telling not telling her that she had to transition me, but now they have people telling parents that if they don't transition their kids, they're abusive. And so little girls who were like me, who cut their hair short and wanted to play sports and felt uncomfortable all the time in their body, are now told that they're abusive if they don't give their kids a medical path to plastic surgery. My mom didn't have that. In fact, she had a wider society telling her if a girl wants to be tough and rough and tumble and play sports and cut her hair short, that's empowerment, you know, and that girls need to open these boxes in society so that we can be more diverse and we can be who we want to be. And it doesn't have anything to do with being born in the wrong body or needing to cut off healthy organs or to be injected with anything or like the endless stream of what transgenderism now is connected to. Like I remember when I was really young and I used to put on dresses, like I felt so uncomfortable. It's almost like me being in this weird dress was the only thing that could, that existed. It's the only thing that I could focus on. It's like the entire world came down to like, I'm in a dress and this isn't me. This is so uncomfortable. And like that's the experience of gender dysphoria is this like constant like, Who am I? I don't know who I am. I don't know where I fit in. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't fit into that group. I don't fit into this group. And it it almost didn't matter how much I cut my hair short and like acted like a boy. The boys knew I was a girl. And I was and I was in ways punished for that. Like if I ever played sports with boys, they went harder on me than they went on other people on other boys because it was like, oh, do you want to play like you're going to play? So when I was going through all this. I actually had a very useful like frame of mind, which is that this was sexism and that I could be anything that I wanted to be. And then that was strong. And that's what female empowerment used to mean in the 90s. And it doesn't mean that anymore. Now they're telling kids, like girls like I was, who cut their hair short, want to play sports, that they were born in the wrong body and only boys can do those things. And those are pre-gen- pre-verbal gender signs when – girls are showing you this like if a baby picks a dress that means they're a girl and if a baby doesn't want to wear dresses and keeps ripping their dresses off it means they're a boy and so this is stuff you can just like look up in the literature this is stuff that you can look up um of like what are signs that your kid is transgender you can just google that and look it up and it's gender that's what it is and we used to call them gender roles and we used to see it as sexism So for me, gender dysphoria was a very difficult thing to experience. It was scary. It was like, I don't know who I am or where I fit in. And you have this mythology forming in your mind that there's just something wrong with you. And I think that's one of the most tragic things. And it's the reason that I keep coming out is that like, there's nothing wrong with these children. I mean, to the point where they don't need medicalization. It's like if you were convinced that your child had a cold and you just kept giving them medicine and they don't need any medicine. They don't have a cold. There's nothing wrong with them. Kids that are gender nonconforming, there's nothing wrong with them. Girls can cut their hair and play sports. They don't need to be injected with anything. They don't, they don't need anything. They're fine. And so one of the reasons it's so important for me now is that I grew up to be a healthy woman. And if I had been injected with hormones or if my puberty had been blocked, which is – Akin, I mean, you should just say my growth being blocked. Puberty is growth. So it's growth blocking. So like if my growth was blocked, if I was injected with anything, if I had countless plastic surgeries right now, I'd probably be hundreds of thousand dollars in debt and I'd be sick. My bones would be brittle. I would be experiencing probably severe weight gain and diabetes because that's what happens to females. It's like you can look up 
all the negative effects. And then beyond that, there are so many negative effects that we don't know because this is just completely experimental. So we don't know what's going to happen to all these kids that are being transitioned in 10 years. And that's one of the reasons why I'm going to start talking about my story, about how I experienced gender dysphoria and why, like, it's so important to understand that if you leave these kids alone and you empower them to be who they are and to like what they like, they will grow into healthy adults. And as it is now, they're not going to. We're going to see a huge swath of sick kids in in five to 10 years. We're going to see medical malpractice issues. And so people who see it and people who experienced it need to speak up. And that's why I'm here speaking up. So that's all the detail I'm going to go into today. I'd love it if you would leave some questions because I'll continue to talk about my experience with gender dysphoria. Um, I have other stories I'd like to go through because I actually had a friend that we both had gender dysphoria and at the same time that I accepted who I was, she didn't and she transitioned. Um, And so, yeah, I I actually have like real life comparisons. Um, There are so many things that I want to talk about when it comes to my experience with gender dysphoria or questions that you have about transgenderism because I have been studying this for years and there's just so much that I know that I could help people to try to understand maybe what's happening to your child or maybe what's happening to you. So I think it's really important that we open these discussions to different ideas, not this same narrative, this affirmation narrative over and over again. I do not affirm transgenderism. I would be sick right now if I had affirmed transgenderism. And so I want to open the conversation to other people who don't affirm transgenderism. It's not the mainstream story of like, you're valid, you're so beautiful, accept, queen, slay, like raising money for breast implants. Another thing that I'm going to talk about is women pick at DC and my experience and there's a lot of negative things that happen. There's a lot of good things that happen too. So I want to like dive into what happened in DC and what my experience was as an organizer within the radical feminist community and the dangers and the harms that can come from organizing and all of the good things that can come from organizing and really like what we should be doing as communities to bring public awareness to this issue and to stop the medicalization and to stop these things being codified into law. So tune in, send me some questions, click like and subscribe.